hanging out in the country one day, and they had a, a, a spat. I mean, it was it was a it was a real, real, intense disagreement. So much so that they actually shut down. They didn't even talk to each other. Silent treatment. They rode for miles and miles and miles. Didn't say a word to each other. So mad because of the fight they had had. And they were probably in their 70s and they were just riding along out in the countryside. And finally they rode by and, and out in this field, this farmer's field, were about six old mules out there grazing in the pasture. So the man decided he'd get a jab in and he'd look at his wife and he looked at those mules and he'd said, huh, looks like some of your relatives. She looked back at him and she said, huh, they are by marriage. <laughs> now, I don't know who you're married to and I don't know how you would describe your relationship, but I want to take just a few moments today and talk with you from the Word of God on how to have a perfect marriage. Uh, how if you can't have a perfect marriage this side of heaven, how it can be more than it is now, how it can be better than it is now. I want you to understand something. God wants every marriage to be a perfect marriage. It is the heart of God, it is the desire of God for your marriage to work, and not just to work, but to thrive, to be uh, something that would be the epitome of life for you, that would be the joy of life for you. The reason I say that, the reason I know that, is because of all the word pictures, all the symbols that God could have chosen to describe to a lost world what a relationship between man and God would look like. Now you think about all the symbols that God could have used to describe to a lost man or a lost woman what it means for God to love us and us to love God. Do you realize the symbol that God chose was the symbol of a marriage? I didn't know that he was going to do this, but Brother Benji, in his scripture reading this morning, read, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Wives, love your husbands as unto the Lord and submitting as, as, as you would to Jesus. And so of all the word pictures, all the symbols that God could have used to describe how He loves us and how He wants us to love Him, God chose to use the symbol of a marriage to describe that. So that tells me if God loves us and wants to love us and He has chosen marriage to describe it, then that means God wants your marriage to work. Because if your marriage doesn't work, if your marriage does not bring joy and fulfillment, if your marriage doesn't bring happiness to your home, if your marriage isn't vibrant and growing, then what does that say to a lost world? It says to a lost world, you can have a relationship with God, but it'll be dull and it'll be unfaithful and it'll be dry and it'll be boring and, and it will be full of conflict. And that's not what God wants the world to see. When he looks at our relationship. So quickly this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul had received a letter from the Corinthian church. And they had asked some specific questions. Including some questions about marriage and relationships. So therefore he starts out chapter 7 by saying. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me. Paul says you, you, I got your letter. Saw your questions. So here, here we go. We're going to try to answer them. He said, it is not good, or it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't shake a woman's hand, or it doesn't mean that necessarily you can't hug a woman. You know, what in the world is Paul saying? Is he crazy? It's, it's good for a man not to touch a woman? The word touch in the Greek means a touch that stimulates, that touch that leads to so much more than just a touch. Paul says, that is not good. And he goes on to describe why. He says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own, not partner, not girlfriend. He says, so you will avoid sexual immorality, get married. Have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband. Again, not same sex, opposite sex, and not sex outside of marriage, but sex within marriage, and it should be enjoyed only in the confines of holy matrimony. Verse 3, let the husband render to his wife, the King James says, the due benevolence, the New King James says, the affection that's due her. And likewise, also the wife render to her husband the due benevolence or the affection that's due him. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but her husband does. And get, get this, it's not talking about 
boyfriend, girlfriend. Now we're talking about marriage, the wife, the husband, he says. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So, in verse 5, he says, don't deprive one another, except, and with consent, only for a short time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. But be sure to come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The English Standard Version translates that passage this way. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is not good, or it is good for man to not have sexual relations with a woman outside of marriage. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have the authority over her own body but her husband. And the husband doesn't have authority over his own body but his wife. Don't deprive one another except perhaps by agreement, mutual, for a time, limited, that you may devote yourselves to prayer Come together again quickly so that Satan will not tempt you and destroy you because of your lack of self-control. Columnist Mike Royko of the Chicago Tribune proposed the following warning to be placed on every marriage license issued in the United States. He said this ought to be put on every license, marriage license given. Warning! Use this at your own peril. The Census Bureau statistics say that using this license could be real dangerous to your future mental, physical, and financial health and could make you miserable for the rest of your life if you live that long. It could lead to arguing, yelling, screaming, boozing, sulking, getting the old silent treatment, and a bunch of kids that are goofed up and making you feel guilty. That's a gloomy outlook, isn't it? But really, if you listen to this culture, that's kind of the outlook the culture has when it comes to marriage. Marriage? Who wants to get married? I mean, after all, even the Christian marriages don't work. I mean, they're supposed to be the ones with the answers, and yet their divorce rate is as high as the world's, which is true. Matter of fact, it's not a whole lot better when you even talk about preachers. Did you realize that they did a study not long ago, and 20% of all preachers surveyed had had marital failure? themselves. 50% of all couples, 20% of all preachers. The church is not immune. So why does Paul take the time? Why does the Holy Spirit put this passage in God's Word for us? So that we will have vibrant, growing, loving homes and marriages. Yesterday, I received, and I hope you feel the same, shocking news that Justice Antonin Scalia of our Supreme Court died suddenly. Now to some, that's just, well, a man famous that died. But folks, I'm here to tell you, if you're not read up on what's going on, you won't realize what a blow to our culture, especially as believers, the death of Justice Scalia is. He was one of the most conservative men on the Supreme Court. He was an originalist. He was a constitutionalist. He was a constructionist. And he believed just like God's Word doesn't change, the Constitution doesn't change. It doesn't, it's not living. It's not breathing. It doesn't change when the culture changes. What they say, a matter of fact, this is a direct quote from Justice Scalia. He said, it is a legal document, talking about the Constitution, it is a legal document. It says what it says, and it doesn't say what it doesn't say. One of the strongest opinions that I have ever written or ever read that came out of the Supreme Court was Justice Scalia's dissenting opinion when Obergefell versus Hodges, the decision that legalized gay marriage, came down. Every one of the dissenting justices took time to write a dissent. And Justice Scalia, he wasn't the lead to write for the, for the opposition or the dissent, but he wrote, and it was scathing, because he believed in the concept of biblical marriage and how that is the bedrock to our society. Folks, look, we need to pray. Look, we all, we all, all, have, all along have needed to pray for our upcoming election. But even more so now is it critical because this president or the next president will decide who takes Justice Scalia's seat. And I promise you it will have an effect on this body of believers and on every believer in America. I trust that you'll pray. So what does Paul say here about marriage? First of all, we see that he gives a word. Well, that's not my notes. I'm punching the right button. We're getting pickup lines. 
First of all, Paul talks about the spiritual relationship. Look in verse 5. He says, Don't deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. First of all, in this passage, in this verse, he talks about an awareness that couples need to develop. The Christian home is a special place of attack. He said, look, if you, if you separate, if, if you do not have that union, that physical, spiritual, emotional intimacy, if you decide not to have that intimate, uh, physical, emotional, spiritual connection, you better watch out and be careful. It only should be for a time because Satan is there to tempt you for your lack of self-control. Satan wants to destroy the family. And families that have perfect marriages will be aware that Satan's out there to bring you down. Dating couples, listen to me, dating couples will understand no matter how strong I am and no matter how strong she is, there is a devil that's waiting at every turn to destroy our relationship before it ever starts. And by the way, let me just say this, a lot in our culture today are foregoing marriage because they see that even Christian marriages are not surviving and they say, we don't want to do that, so we'll just live together. You can look at the statistics. They are not Christian statistics. They are secular statistics. And you will see that a couple who lives together is not preparing themselves for marriage. They are preparing themselves for divorce. Because the divorce rate among living together couples goes through the roof compared to traditional biblical couples who do not. God knows what he's doing. And dating couples and married couples that have perfect marriages and perfect relationships, godly relationships, understand they have an awareness that there's a devil out there that wants to destroy your life. Not only is there an awareness, but they also develop an allegiance. He says here that we will do this thing together. Notice a tiny word in verse 5. It says, don't deprive one another except with consent for a time. And if you are not together physically, emotionally, mentally, intimately. He said, if you do separate for a time, only do that so you can fast and pray. In other words, your allegiance to each other is only surpassed by your allegiance to God. If God is not number one, if God is not the one we please, if God is not the one that is that third part of that triangle that brings us together, then our marriages will never work. He must have the preeminence. What did Benji read this morning? Jesus says there's only two commandments. You can wrap up the whole Bible in two statements. Number one, love God. Number two, love each other. And I'm here to tell you, you can't love each other right if you don't love God right. If God's not number one, not just important, He's got to be preeminent. And if He's not preeminent, then the marriage will never work as it should. Folks, I can tell you, 25 years of marriage, I'm sure Sister Betty Lou and Brother Elwood could say this, and many of you others can say this, it's been married longer than Miranda and I. This is a fact. I have seen it every single time. When she and I are on the outs with each other, and we do get that way, we don't fight. We have intense moments of fellowship, okay? But we do have rough times. We do have rocky times. And every single time when there's problems in our relationship, if we'll be honest with each other, before there were problems between me and her, there were problems between me and him. If I don't have that right, I can't have this right. It is a fact of life. There is a spiritual relationship that must be there. An awareness that the devil wants to destroy me, and an allegiance with Jesus Christ who will help me fight off the evil one. The second thing he talks about is not just the spiritual relationship, but the going back to this. Go ahead and fast forward those two guys, those two guys, uh, the slides, fellas, for sake of time. The sensual relationship. The sensual relationship. He says this. He says, Now concerning the things that you wrote me. Paul had received a letter. He's writing to the Corinthians. So that means the letter came from where? It came from Corinth. Corinth was a wicked place. As a matter of fact, Corinth had been a Greek city. Now Corinth was a Roman city. And in Greek Roman culture, you had what was called consorts and concubines. You've heard the concubine word used in, in the Bible before. Consorts were sexual partners of the same sex. Concubines were sexual partners of the opposite sex. And then you had your spouse. 
So to be it, to be on the inside, to be popular, to be accepted in Corinthian society, in Greco-Roman society, you would have your consort, you would have your concubine, and you would also have your spouse. Folks, what we're dealing with today is not different, it's not new. We have been dealing with it for millennia. The sin nature has never changed. The desire for immorality has never changed. It is a weakness in our flesh. It is a perversion of what God put there and gifted and intended. And so they were dealing with it in Corinth and they were writing Paul. and said, what in the world are we supposed to do? Not only was that existing as if that was not bad enough, they would have pagan temples around. One of the temples in Corinth was the temple to a goddess named Diana. She was the goddess of sex and fertility. Do you realize that there were 1,500, 1,500 prostitutes that worked at the temple of Diana. And so if you went to church in Paul's day in Corinth and you went to worship, worship involved intimate relationships with temple prostitutes. So you had your consort of the same sex, you had your concubine of the opposite sex, you had your spouse, and you couldn't even get away from it when you went to your church because that was the part of worshiping your God. It was everywhere. They lived in a saturated society. And so they were writing to Paul and said, what does God want us to do? And he says, well, I'm going to give you two words. First of all, he said, I'm going to give you a word to the waiting. If you're not married, Paul says in verse 1, it is good for a man not to touch, a touch that stimulates a woman. In other words, Paul says, just like, and I'm going to trivialize this, and I really hate to trivialize something that's so serious, but think about the game of football. The game of football is a wonderful game. One of my favorite sports to watch football. But can you imagine playing football when there's no rules? Can you imagine playing football? Can you imagine the Super Bowl last Sunday night? And some of us don't want to imagine that game because it, you know, our team didn't win. But can you imagine what would, have had, what would have happened if there were no rules? Sometimes the most upset that a person gets in sports it's not because his team did badly. It's not because the other team did great. Sometimes the most angry we get in sports is when the referee doesn't do his job. Say amen. When there's a, a blown call or when somebody stepped out of bounds and there was no whistle. Because we understand for the game to be enjoyed and for the sport to have sport, we must play according to the boundaries. And God says, look, I have given you the gift of sexuality. God created it in a beautiful way, in a perfect world, in a garden. Sex is not the result of a fall. Now, don't, don't blush, okay? Preacher, I don't think we all talk about that in here. Well, you'll go home, and all week long, you'll let your kids hear what the world says about it on television. Let me just tell you what God says about it, okay? First of all, sex is not a, res not a resort of the fall. God created the gift of sexuality to be enjoyed by Adam and Eve. They were the only two people in the world, and God was there. Now think about this. Adam and Eve were perfect. They were not sinful at all. God gave them the gift of sexuality. God, His presence was there constantly, but God would not let them stay there by themselves unmarried. He said, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and wife, a father and mother cleave unto his wife, they two shall become one flesh. God immediately married him. He made Eve and he, 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 but preacher, it was a perfect world. He's a perfect father. That's true. But God gives us a perfect pattern. And he says to the waiting that sexual activity outside of marriage is wrong. And by the way, he's not just talking about the activity. He says don't even touch a touch that leads to stimulation. Because if you give the devil an inch, He'll take a mile. That's the way he works. We need to make sure, the Bible says, never give place to the devil. All of Europe was conquered, not in 1945. You know when Europe got conquered? You know when Europe, the mainland continent of Europe was conquered? June 6, 1944. That's when, if you know your history, you know that was the day of the D-Day invasion. When the Allied forces put a toehold on Hitler's continent of Europe and they established a beachhead in Normandy, from that point on, Hitler's days was numbered. And you let the devil have a toehold in your life. You let the devil have a toehold in your relationship. Oh, we're not going all the way, just halfway. Oh, we're just, you know, we're, after all, can't help. You let the devil have a toehold. 
You start flirting outside your spouse. You start looking at things you ought not look at. You start playing around. Let the devil have a beachhead. He will conquer you. Paul also not only talks about a word to the waiting, he also talks about a word to the wedded. He says the only time you should not be intimate, the only time that you should not render the due benevolence that you uh, owe to one another is only when you want to get closer to the Lord and only when you, not as a weapon, not because she made you mad, not to, to deprive him because you can't stand him. Notice what Paul says. He says, first of all, render due benevolence. Now, I'm talking to married couples now. I'm not talking about unmarried couples. The word render is a command. He said, I, and it is, it is a command that is in perfect tense, active voice, imperative mood in the Greek. Perfect tense means it is a continual action. He says, you render today, you render tomorrow, you render next week, you keep on rendering. It's an active voice, which means whatever the verb is, is not to be done by just one side. The rendering is to be done by both parties. Both man and wife are to render. And an imperfect tense means, it, or imperative mood means it is a command of God, it's not a suggestion. So he looks at us and he says, render both of you, I command you, today and every day. Notice what he says, the affection, the King James, I love the King James translation here. He says, the due benevolence. I have a debt to my wife to take care of her physically, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. Every aspect of her, I am indebted to her and is a debt that I never pay fully. She is indebted to me. She has a debt she owes to me. I do not have authority over my body but her. She doesn't have authority over her body but mine. We are to render. That is a word to the wedded. And then the last thing I want to mention to you is the special relationship. So much more I could say. So much more I wish I had time to say. But let me just close out by saying in verse 5, he says, don't deprive each other unless it be for a time, and that is only by mutual consent. I want you to notice what he says about this special relationship we call marriage. Marriage is far more than physical intimacy. It's far more than just sexuality. He tells us about the two areas of marriage that are often neglected and as a result will cause your marriage to suffer. The first thing he talks about is the closeness of marriage. Back up in verse 3, he talks about the due benevolence. That's more than just sexuality. That is tenderness, affection, closeness, holding hands, spending time alone together, being kind one to another. Too many Christian marriages are just couples that live together and share the same bed, but there is no love there. We do not witness to a dying world well when we just go through the motions in our home. There must be a closeness. It's far more than just the physical. Goodwill, affection, respect. Not only a closeness, but a communication. He says, if you do come apart, if there is a distance between you, it only should be by consent, mutual consent. You've sat down together. You've talked it out. You've communicated. And you said, look, I need to spend some time with the Lord. I need to spend some time with the Lord. We need to communicate that our relationship to God is first and then our relationship to one another is second. That only comes from communicating. That special relationship called marriage. Dr. Ed Young, longtime Baptist pastor, said this. The ideal marriage is not give and take. It's give and give. God wants me, God wants you to have a perfect marriage. In Jesus Christ, he can make it perfect in him with imperfect people, surrendered to God, devoted to Christ, living through the Holy Spirit by his grace and his mercy. We honor Christ. And folks, I am here to tell you, when we honor Christ, he honors us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together this morning. Thank you for your word that speaks to our hearts. And Lord, I do pray this morning that you will help our couples. First of all, Lord, our dating couples. That with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, they'll live for Christ. And we'll have relationships that honor you. 
relationships that are holy and pure, realizing, Lord, not only does that honor you, but that will also go to build strong, lasting relationships. Lord, I don't have the time to talk about all the studies that have been done that show the more familiar physically dating couples are before marriage, the higher the risk of divorce after marriage. Lord, the things we do before we ever say I do can make or break that long-lasting home we desire to build. And then, Lord, to our married couples, I pray you would help us to show all those that are in Beaufort County that are lost by our marriage and our love to our spouse just a picture of what your love for a man and a man's love for God really looks like fleshed out. Father, today if we have marriages that are in trouble, I pray you would bring them to Jesus. I pray, Lord, they would lay their marriage at your feet and allow you to redeem and restore. Father, today if we have marriages that are suffering and struggling because one spouse does not know the Lord and the other spouse does, I pray you would bring that unbelieving spouse to Christ. And I pray, God, that you would take that believing spouse and give them strength and courage to live boldly for Jesus in front of their mate. Lord, you know our hearts and you know this church will only be as strong as the relationships that make up this church and sit every Sunday in the pews. I pray, dear Lord, you would be glorified. And I pray you'd be honored every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with your head bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around? As the musicians just softly play, the altars are open this morning. If you need to come, get along with the Lord. Talk to Him about any need in your life, any need in your home, any need in your relationship. We beg you, we invite you, we plead with you. If you would, just please step out and come. Give it to the Lord who can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. God can redeem it. God can restore it. God can reclaim it.